So we are returned from the big break. That's it, folks. That was the big break. <laughs> that wasn't five minutes. You contracted for five minutes, Rona. <laughs> no, we comply. Is this the interview? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. So this is another learning conversation where I hope to do some learning from Hazel. Maybe we will all do some learning from Hazel. Um, particularly about working in the Middle East and especially focusing, I'm particularly interested to focus on your working in Saudi Arabia. And I guess part of the motivation I have for wanting to find out more and, and to learn from you is because I'm very aware of my own prejudices and stereotypes of Saudi Arabia in particular and the Middle East in general at our time. And I guess I'm probably not the only person in this room that has some um, strong and probably simplistic ways of viewing those cultures. So I'm curious, Hazel, how did you get to be doing the work that you're doing in that part of the world anyway? Um, I guess like a lot of my life, by accident. <laughs> um, I never ever dreamt I would be going to Saudi Arabia. But there was a build up to it because I work Although I have my own company, I also work as a director of coaching and learning for a consultancy. And one of the key directors works primarily in the Middle East. Um, first of all in Bahrain, but I knew that Saudi Arabia was also very figural. Um, and we talked for about 18 months actually about the potential of maybe going to Saudi to bring coaching. And was there any question during that 18 months of talking about a woman going to that part of the world around coaching? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, there are so many boundaries. Uh, even to get into the country, to be honest, is a major step to get the visa as a woman. Mm -hmm. Even now, um, I can't get a year's visa because I'm a woman. Men can, but not a woman. So, uh, you know, there's, there was the whole thing about being sponsored and just even that arrival was quite something. Um, and then I, I had a lot of uh, assumptions and preconceptions about Saudi Arabia and the news uh, and what I read and the terrible stuff, you know, that I've read. But something in me, I don't know, something in me wanted to go. Um, and see, explore. Um, but I did do quite a lot of work around safety, my safety oh. and protection. Such as? Um, I spoke to several people who had been there, women who had been. I spoke to some Arab women out there um, by Skype and asked them what it would be like for me to go mm. and what I would need to be like um, and also what it's like, really like for them. Um, and what I discovered was that um, we had the most wonderful conversations and sharing and they were really excited about me going and the fact that I would I wanted to go that they saw that as um, just wonderful and what was the thinking in the consultancy you were working for about a woman going to be providing programs initially if I remember it was for men I think my, the chairman of the company was equally nervous. I didn't really totally realize that actually at the time, um, but I discovered that later, that he was very anxious about the first woman from our company going. Uh, and he spent quite a lot of time with me talking about lots of the rituals um, and his experience of being there. And I talked quite openly about that I was, as a woman, it would be very different for me. Mm -hmm. um, but it was great sharing. And I felt very supported by him. 
But I also knew that I, as far as coaching an Arab man was probably going to be extremely difficult, but that I could work with uh, groups with a male colleague within the organisation, not as an open programme, because if you do that, you have to have a screen down the middle and the men and the women would be separate. And at one point we had a crazy conversation, I might be even out of the room, <laughs> which I did laugh at actually, but because I said, well, there's no way we can do that. So the way we've got around some of that is to actually work within, inside an organisation. So can you have men and women in the room together? You can, yeah, you okay. can. Um, do you find there are many women in any positions of seniority in the organisations you're working in? Well, I have really been surprised that, um, th and this is a generalisation, I equally know there's a lot of places where this doesn't happen, but um, in many of the organisations I've now been in, there are a lot of women employees. And it varies. Uh, in some organisations, they're in a completely separate place. Um, but in others, there's integration. And for me, that's the pioneering part that there is some change and movement towards that. Uh, even actually in the biggest bank in Saudi, which I've worked with, they now have a woman as head of coaching mm -hmm. and they've just promoted a woman as head of strategy. And it's like there's a slow shifting towards change at this time. Mm -hmm. And are these multinational organizations or are they, they are, Saudi? They are Saudi owned organizations mm -hmm. with expatriates coming into to it, but mostly Arab, because you know they have a huge program of Saudiization, mm -hmm. which is that we want our people to be doing these jobs now and less expatriate people <coughs> coming in. So more women are, and I think because of that, more women are coming into the workplace. And how are you finding you need to adapt or change um, coaching, for example, coaching processes to the Saudi culture? I think um, I think it's about finding the need. What is the need for coaching? I'm not sure that's any different than the UK or any other country I've worked in, but there's something about what is the, the need for... And I'm saying coaching, but actually I think it's something else about um, a dialogue that's different and different to the dialogue that we have now because out there the dialogue is very much, um, and it doesn't matter actually whether it's male or female, that it's, uh, you are a manager, you're a leader, therefore I'm supposed to tell you what to do, and the employee expects you to do that. Mm -hmm. So you're my leader, don't ask me questions, you tell me what to do. So where's this desire for a shift in the change of dialogue coming from? Is this an organisational piece? Is this about a change in strategy that the organisation is holding? I, I think it's wider than that, but I think, that, you know, in the field I'm in, it, I'm noticing it in the organisational piece. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I'm noticing it in, in the organisational system more, and it's a... Uh, but I'm also noticing it outside when I meet people, you know, I met quite a lot of people now in Saudi Arabia, men and women, and the conversation tends to be about change. And I, I've been amazed how often people talk about that they want something different. They don't want quite a lot of what is going on. Mm -hmm. You know, the suppression, the kind of keeping people down. They want something a bit different that has more energy. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm noticing. So when you say it's a wider change, I mean, Saudi is, is well known to have a royal family that seem to be the dominant political force. Is that coming from the royal family? It's uh, certainly coming from the king at the moment, but the king is quite old, senior, I mean. He's in his 80s. Um, oh, not like you and me. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he has actually done a huge amount to promote change. Uh -huh. um, in fact, outside Riyadh, there is a huge university, primarily for women, and it is like a city. It is unbelievable. It has everything in it. I mean, it's just massive, and it is for women and their education. Uh -huh. And not many people know that, but that is him and his wife. They have pushed that. 
But there are definitely other people in that family that do not want this change, and that will be the danger. Mm -hmm. When there's a change of power, who knows? Mm -hmm. And what for you has been the most, I was going to say difficult, challenging aspect of working there? Um, I think it's the shift between when I'm there, I'm more contained, whereas at home I'm more, you know, <laughs> like kind of most things go, don't they? More lively. Yeah, more lively. I'm more, you know, most things go. You can say things in a dialogue that are accepted. People may not agree, but you can have that debate. Whereas out there I feel... I do feel more contained about what I say and how I say it. Um, and there are a lot of rituals, a lot of rituals that um, I'm becoming more aware of. Such a? So, some, so a woman can um, put her hand out to shake the hand of a man, but sometimes they will not and they will go, you know. And it's like, well, okay, they won't. But a man won't usually come up and shake your hand. You have to go first. So there's lots of little things, and this whole thing about you have to sit in a different place, you know, within a hotel even, um, it's just strange. It's very strange mm -hmm. to say that, you know, and if you go into somewhere that you're not allowed, it's very obvious you are not meant to be there. And challenges in the work, in the coaching and leadership development work? I think that the, I'm thinking of all the people I've met, um, I think that there is an unconscious and conscious approach. I think unconsciously uh, what I notice is that there's a very laissez-faire in Charlotte approach. It's, I, would, I sometimes think it's a bit of an excuse not to do something. But it's a very well, God willing, this will happen. And we'll, we'll turn up when we get there. And uh, you say Tuesday, maybe we'll be there on Tuesday, maybe not. We start a session at 10, well, we might be there at 10 or we might not be. It's just culturally very, very different to, you know, Western, which is right, well, we will start at 10. <laughs> you know, that kind of... And it runs right through the system from leadership because often they don't model it. So consciously they'll say, we're going to change this round here and we're going to have sort of values and rules, but actually that's not how they are behaving. Mm -hmm. It's like there's this massive gap and things don't happen that need to happen. Mm -hmm. That is a huge challenge. And the other bit that I was thinking about wondering if it's a challenge for you is the ethics of working in another culture and being a foreigner in that culture and introducing foreign ways as it were what's your what's your reflections I think that the ethics for me are about um, I don't know. Sometimes I feel I don't agree, but I will experience this. I will try and see. But there are some things that I won't. Um, but there are things that I know I can't change. I have mm -hmm. to accept. If I'm going to go there, I have to accept that's how it is. Mm -hmm. So ethically, it's challenged my views because I, I, now I've been there, it's, diff it's been a different experience to what I'd imagined. Mm -hmm. And that has changed the way I am back in England and it's changed the way I'm viewing my own life. In what way? I think that I have an experience now that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. um, when people talk to me about Saudi Arabia and they've never been and they only have read I feel now I've been and I've experienced it and it's not exactly as you read it. In fact, a lot of it isn't as you read. And that has, cha that has challenged me about a lot of stuff that I've read in the past. Okay. Even about management, leadership, you know, it's like, well, it's not quite like that, actually. Yeah, yeah. And the biggest thing is about, actually, um, I don't believe it's about me at all going in there and posing my view. 
I think it's about facilitating a process of something mm -hmm. for them to learn from. And you talked earlier when we were introducing about um, what is culture. What, what's your thinking out of your experience? How do you answer that question to yourself? I think it's a felt experience first. Mm -hmm. And then I can intellectualize it. And I can put it into, like your lovely diagram, I can put it into all sorts of pieces, you know, parts. It's regional, it's, cult it's, um, it's family, it's language, it's but it's a felt, it's a felt experience first, mm -hmm. of colour, of smell, mm -hmm. of busyness. It's the same coming to Florence, you mm -hmm. know. It's a felt experience, mm. and that's what I I feel out there, and that's what's helping me understand more about culture wherever I am. I, you know, this year I've been to uh, Croatia, to Brussels, to Switzerland to the Middle East, it's like everywhere I go now, I'm just more aware of the felt experience mm -hmm. and how people sit or, you know, I was in Denmark and they all put their hands up when you ask a question and it was like, wow, yes. <laughs> that's really I've different. I've had that, <laughs> yes. It's yeah. like being back at school yeah. for me, but yeah. that's what they do. So. so there's educational cultures and there is something you're saying more about a national or an ethnic yeah. and culture. Religious, religious. And religious culture. Yeah. And traditions. Yeah the traditions mm -hmm. of that. And you also said, as, as we went around this morning, that what you're interested in is empathy mm -hmm. and engagement. Mm -hmm. Say a bit more about what you meant by engagement. Um, I, I suppose, co I mean, in many ways, coaching has helped me with this because I think it is about having a dialogue, a conversation with somebody without imposing, you know, I'm interested. Mm -hmm. And so the engagement starts at the interest level for me. So I think about Byrne and his notion of being curious. Mm, yeah. yeah. That's fundamental. Yeah, it's fundamentally I'm curious about the people that I meet there, that how they are, how they are, you know, um, why they think the way they think. Mm -hmm. And equally, I find then the people who are interested in that from me, from the West. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's that it's the dialogue, the conversation, being curious, and um, there is something about you know the saying about walking in someone else's shoes. Mm. There's something about that for me, trying to walk in their shoes for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so if they they say come out to wherever, I will go, because I think, yeah, I'd like to, to experience. So what I'm hearing for you, your way of working is to be very much at that level of individual to individual within the system. Within the system. But I also work with groups too. Mm -hmm. So I'm working a lot with groups as well, coaching mm -hmm. development groups, coaching leadership groups mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of managers and leaders, yeah. Mm -hmm which is the bringing together. Mm -hmm. It's complex. Yeah. <laughs> it's very complex. And what's it like to be wearing the full gear? You wear the full gear when you in yeah. Saudi. Yeah, you have to. You have to wear. Uh -huh. Before you get off the plane, you have to. OK. Um, well. So how much of your face can you have exposed? I, as a Western woman, you can show uh, all your face. And there's a difference between Jeddah and Riyadh, because Jeddah is more liberal. Mm -hmm. So in Jeddah, I don't have to wear the scarf, the hijab. I just wear an abaya. So you can have your hair? So I can have my hair, which oh. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and in Riyadh, I, I usually have to wear the hijab. And you can show your hair even out on the street? Or? Yes, in Jeddah, yes. Wow. In Jeddah, I have seen an Arab man and woman walking along hand in hand. Wow. A few times now. Okay. So cha there's a change, yeah. 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 But wearing the buyer is very interesting. Um, it's like wearing a long coat. And the thing is, you can wear what you like underneath. So I'm still the same person, you know. I'm just, I just wear the coat. But, but I have to admit, I do have a selection of them. 
and they are usually colourfully trimmed, which is so me. There's a fashion in the Abaya. Yeah, there's a fashion in the Abaya. Yeah, glad you go there. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah. And from your experiences of meeting women there, what's impacted you most? I really thought that the women would be meek and um, passive. And what I've experienced is the women being amazingly outspoken, very assertive. Um, they know that they want something. <coughs> they um, are, when they're in a group, they create a lot of debate. Mm. It's fascinating. Mm. Um, and in many ways, because, I, because in the home, the woman does run the home. She is, you know, the leader in the home. Mm. And so what I notice is that more that they bring that into the workplace. They're mm. transferring those skills into the workplace. Mm. And uh, that's quite an interesting link. Mm. That's a really interesting piece. I notice when I'm uh, in India, or when Indian people come to my training in Oxford, um, the women are very feisty, very strong, and they will turn on some of the British women and say, what are you on about? You know, get clear what your contract is in a marriage and a job and all the rest of it. Very clear, very boundaried, um, and therefore able to be very assertive within their roles, because the roles are so clear. And they see people in the West as being extremely confused, women in the West, being very confused about roles and blurring the private with the professional and the organization, which I think is a really interesting yeah. response. And that, that is the other piece that when you talk to women, they, um, you know, the family unit is really important. And they're very strong about their family unit and about their beliefs around that. Mm. So, yeah, they bring that too, which I think is wonderful. Mm. That sometimes I think we are losing. I could ask you lots more, but I think we should draw this to a close as a, a taste of the other culture that we're not part of. Because so far we've been talking about cultures being part of. So I'm going to pass to Sylvie who's going to structure the next part. Thank you very much.